As a brief aside, other neurological conditions appear to share a similarly compromised ability to use glucose as a fuel for the brain, including, to differing degrees, migraines, epilepsy, depression, and even some instances of autism. A final disorder connected with insulin is of broad interest, body fat. In 1923, Austrian physician scientist Wilhelm Falta noted, a functionally intact pancreas is necessary for fattening. He further documented that the most efficient way to fatten a human, calorie for calorie, was to include abundant amounts of food that increase insulin, which is created in the pancreas. Many scientific reports reveal that insulin therapy significantly reduces metabolic rate, accounting for as much as 30% of the fat gain. At this point, you're expecting me to give you a clear, simple solution. And here it is. We must control insulin to control metabolic health. A scientifically sound strategy to control insulin is based on adjusting macronutrients to favor sources of energy that have the smallest effect on insulin. When carbohydrate is consumed in the form of pure glucose, very similar to eating a refined starch or sugar, insulin dramatically increases to well above 10 times over normal and, depending on the person, can remain elevated for several hours. Though this can vary, when a person eats pure protein, insulin will usually increase slightly over normal levels for a time. Remarkably, fat consumption, in contrast, has no effect on insulin. Based on these data and dozens of related clinical studies, three conclusions have become pillars for me. One, we need to control carbohydrates. I'm not advocating the avoidance of an entire group of macronutrients. After all, carbohydrates include a remarkable range of foods. Rather if the carbohydrate comes in a bag or a box with a barcode, it's likely one to be careful with. Of course, sugar, in its many forms and clever names, is uniquely terrible. This includes fruit juice and smoothies. If you want to control insulin and enjoy fruit, eat it. Don't drink it. Two, we should prioritize protein. A case has recently been made in scientific literature that recommendations of dietary protein are insufficient for most people to maintain and promote muscle and bone mass, which is critical for maintaining good health and insulin sensitivity throughout life. Depending on age and activity, an optimal level of dietary protein is around 1 to 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram body weight. Importantly, this need for dietary protein increases with age. As we get older, we need more protein. Three, we need to stop fearing fat. We have a strong cultural aversion to dietary fat. In fact, by many estimates, we eat a smaller portion of our diets from fat now than ever before. Dietary fat is a remarkable energy source. Because it has no effect on insulin, on its own, in a way, it has the ability to feed our bodies, but not our fat, providing a new version of an old adage, we aren't what we eat. For the second part of this process, I recommend you test what you learn. When you think you've found sufficient evidence to support an ideal lifestyle plan to fight insulin resistance and its related complications, try it for a month. Keep in mind that the changes you make will ideally be sufficiently practical to follow indefinitely.